America Meditating Radio Show, we collect wisdom, inspire each other, and empower hearts 24-7. Hi, I'm Sister Jenna. Join me and guest on Blog Talk Radio as we amplify stories that compel us to be more for ourselves and everyone else around us. The Meditation Museum in Silver Spring, Maryland offers a variety of courses and activities to make your life go a whole lot smoother. Located at 9525 Georgia Avenue, you will be able to experience the beautiful silence that's in the space. There are courses in Raj Yoga Meditation, Positive Thinking, Stress-Free Living, and Personal Development classes. For more information, call us at 301-588-0144 or visit us online at meditationmuseum.org. The Miracle Medical Clinic is a clinic that has been providing quality health care services to the Houston area since 1996. In a comfortable environment, they are dedicated to helping you live a healthy lifestyle for years to come. For more information, please call 713-464-0236. Or visit us at our website at www.miraclemedicalclinic.com. The Miracle Medical Clinic, where preventive health care is waiting for you. Are you in need of a tech service company that's going to deliver the best solutions for your business? Then Atronica is your solutions headquarters. Here we specialize in your individual needs to make sure your business shines. For more information, please call 301 301- Four one seven zero zero seven zero, or visit us at our website at attronica.net. At Tronica, where we deliver for you. Get off the grid and step inside your heart. Sister Jenna guides you through a powerful, encouraging, and motivating meditation that allows you to let go and become aware of you, regain strength, power, and peace. Hello, everyone, and welcome to America Meditating. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and we are in an inclusive revolution where we're seeing the benefits of the elections, individuals who have been sitting down and basically just moving along with a system that they're just used to are now waking up and are getting on the streets and are going to their members of Congress, and they're signing up, and they're registering. And I've been asking everyone, please get involved with your local city that you're in, your district that you're in, get involved with your state, and then be aware of your national contribution. Because I think that in order for us to make a change, it has to be some sort of a balanced approach. And if we find ourselves feeling that one person has definitely more control over our lives and they still are basically not thinking about the grand picture party or they're thinking about a particular you know sense of interest or they're just picking thinking about a particular religion then you're going to have winners and you're going to have losers and um haven't we reached a place in our soul journey or our global journey where it just benefits everyone to have a shared interest in the game? Does it serve you to distinguish your own sense of self as the great one by putting another one down? Now, I have to tell you that, you know, I've been running my own community for quite a number of years here in D.C. And on my own spiritual path, I've seen where an information is sent out to everyone. And out of, let's say, a room of ten, come forward, if even two. One come to say, wow, that was amazing, what can I do to help? Or maybe two will come forward and say, that was just exactly what I've been believing in and what I'm doing. But then the other eight, they will just leave the room and just continue with life as usual. They'll either complain or they'll either say, oh, that was good, and then they move on. And we are seeing within our own country a big call to become more activated in our national story, let alone our our city story, but also our own stories. What's going on internally in, in terms of the consciousness of the spirit? And I have to quote something that our brother said, Deepak Chopra, 
He says, only when a person wakes up to choices does wisdom begin to take hold. And wisdom isn't hidden or a secret. The ability of the mind to transcend its own conflict and confusion lies in the heart of one's own spiritual teachings, whether it comes from the East or the West. And so we're looking at an opportunity where we are being called, where the forces of light are nothing but the forces of wakefulness and their powers coming to service, not from fighting the darkness, but from the inner strength, the inner intelligence, your truth, your creativity, and purpose that's actually been existing and sitting there, whether dormant, in your pure consciousness. And if we remain dormant in not activating the purity of our intention, the purity of our spirit, the purity of the soul, then we're going to feel a sense of fear when the darkness surfaces itself and tries to make us believe that it is more powerful than light. And as Martin Luther King Sr. had said, that you know, darkness cannot move darkness out of the way. It's the light that's going to remove the darkness that's in the way. So my brothers and sisters of the American Fiber, whether you stand for the blue or the red, the left or the right, black or white, Hindu or Jew, Muslim or Christian, gay or straight, rich or poor, tall or short, fat or skinny, educated or not, your light within your being is calling you. It's calling you to the surface calling you to stand up and is calling you to believe in that which you were designed to be God's child and we're going to be having a heart to heart conversation with Mark Coleman author of Make Peace with Your Mind and before I go to Mark on the line I want us to step into a meditation to simply ask ourselves to get ourselves back into a space of our own silence and peace and wisdom and to amplify the light that's sitting in our consciousness. Take a deep breath. Om Shanti. The time that we choose to be aware doesn't necessarily require me to just sit and meditate. But even while I walk and move around, I can be in a meditative awareness, which is awareness of the soul, the original, eternal, imperishable being of light. For a little while, I'd like to invite you to be present, to be here, and to be now. Allow your mind to settle in the moment, to relax. This meditation is about awareness. It's about becoming aware of your original and eternal self. It's about connecting to your truth. Let go of your name. And observe yourself feeling nameless. Let go of your gender to discontinue thinking you're a man or a woman. Let it go and observe how you would feel walking around without a gender. Let go of 
the role that you play and let go of the titles that you own. Observe how you're feeling as you are gradually letting go. Let go of your religion and put it aside just for now. And let go of your nationality and even the language that you're accustomed to. Imagine you have no name, gender, role, title, religion, nationality or even a language. Ask yourself, How do you feel at this moment? And in this feeling, who would think of you and who would you think of? The Supreme Soul would think of you, and you, the liberated soul, would think of the Supreme. In this state of absolute freedom, I am truly who I am. A free, Peaceful, pure, immortal, and eternal soul. Allow yourself to just be absorbed in this awareness. this time. Mm. Welcome everyone. You're listening to America Meditating Radio. That was Letting Go from Off the Grid into the Heart by your truly, Sister Jenna. We're proud to welcome Mark Coleman. Mark is an inner and outer explorer who has devotedly studied mindfulness meditation practices for over three decades. He's passionate about the power of meditation and has been teaching mindfulness workshops and meditation retreats in six continents the past 15 years. Mark is the founder of the Mindfulness Institute and has guided students as a corporate consultant, counselor, meditation teacher, and even a wilderness guide. He's also the author of Awake in the Wild and his new release, Make Peace with Your Mind, How Mindfulness and Compassion Can Free You from Inner. Mark, welcome to the America Meditating Radio. Good morning. Very happy to be here with you. Same here, Mark. Mental peace is a very big need right now, isn't it? We are grappling with a lot of internal divisions within our own spirit, spawned by an election that went in a direction based on people who were thinking that the educated and wise at heart kind of had everything in the bag. And we are waking up to experiencing ourselves to have a lot of issues that we didn't know were sitting there. One could be the issue that I don't tolerate value systems which are not inclusive. But then the other issue, and I can only speak for myself, Mark, is 
feeling that I wish to be more powerful for my humanity. This has nothing to do with blue or red. This has nothing to do with gay or straight, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. This has to do with me. My interior world of intentions and truth and values and virtues that I wonder if it's at a more amplified state and if my humanity, even if it was half of my humanity, was at an amplified state, would we be going through what we're going through currently in our country? I would love to talk to you about your personal feelings about these current times and what are some of the things that are coming out internally for you as you view this particular scene that we're going through as a nation? Well, as you say, these are definitely interesting times and times of turmoil for many, both the shock and the surprise of the outcome, but also the ascendancy of what I call tribalism and you know, what Van Jones called white lash, but which really I see as a, a scarcity, fearful, close the borders perspective that I see in Europe, I see happening all around the world. And this current election in the States is just one more expression of what I see as a fearful, scarcity, exclusive view on the world rather than inclusive, rather than generous, rather than uh, respectful of diversity, of religion, of race, of viewpoints. And it's been very troubling to me. I'm English, and so I witnessed the Brexit vote last year, which was a similar expression of not in my backyard, of division, of otherness, of the demonizing the other, and there's been a lot of demonizing of the other in this election. And sadly, it's in, it's, it was a very sad day and a lot of grief last week for me, a lot of tears around seeing how that more fearful part of consciousness has gripped so much of the populace and uh, so much action and cruelty is coming from that place, self-centered greed and hatred and fear. So, you know, I feel appreciative that I have a deep practice that I, you know, that, you know as, as meditators, we're asked to sit in the fire of our experience, whether it's beautiful or painful or difficult. And clearly for many of us, this is a difficult, painful time, and we're asked to bear witness through presence, to bear witness with understanding how did this happen, how are we here, why is there so much fear, why is there so much misunderstanding, why is there so much projection of otherness and hatred. And we're also being asked to, as you mentioned at the beginning of your, of your show, to step up. You know, I think what happens for those of us who take a more progressive stand that it's very easy to go to sleep. And I think there's been a lot of complacency in the last eight years. And since we have this very overt expression of division and fear, uh, we're asked to raise our voice and put our bodies on the line and to put forward another perspective that's inclusive, mm -hmm. that's compassionate, that is welcoming of diversity. Well, I think your book couldn't be more timelier than the, your new release, Make Peace with Your Mind, and how mindfulness and compassion can free you from your inner critic. How can we, England is going through it, America is going through it, Japan, Philippines, uh, South Africa, the countries continue to rack up there in numbers. How can we learn from the inner critic and how can we become participants towards an age that I always mention called the golden age, where we can be different, but we're all walking in our own sense of inner empowerment that I can respect that you're different and not feel insecure or feel that 
there is a lack going on in me. And I, I want you to get back to that question. There's a quick story I want to share with everyone. When I was in my 20s and I was invited to sit for lunch at a table with a group of yogis, these were all senior yogis in India, They were all in their 60s, 70s. They had been on their path for perhaps 50 or 60 years of Raj Yoga meditation. And as thrilled and honored, Mark, as I was to be invited to just be in there for lunch and to be one of them, it was such an awkward experience because I felt so much, I felt less because they were so evolved. Their vibrations were so present, their Their way of eating, their way of being was a place that I hadn't traveled to yet. And there were two thoughts that I remember very specifically that took over my consciousness. One was, right, is that really real? Are they really that divine? One. And then the second Mm -hmm. one was, what can I do to get to that level? Because it makes me feel better. And, And I'm just wondering if we're going through this game of where when we see change, and it might seem like it could be better than where we were, that instead of trying to optimize my powers at B, uh, I tend to we tend to maybe take the next road. Well, what's wrong with them to make us feel like we're the better one? Can you speak mm-hmm. to us regarding that? Because the critic will sometimes put something down to feel big, whereas the, the wise one would say, well, tell me what I need to learn so I can get better. Yeah. So the inner critic is a very powerful force in our mind, and it's mostly uh, negatively oriented towards the faults and deficiencies and lacks of ourselves or others. And it's a voice that we've developed from early childhood. It was initially designed to protect us in certain ways, but over time it's taken on a life of its own that uh, has become quite destructive in a way that reminds us or points to inadequacies or deficiencies or how we're not enough or how where our faults lie. And so it's become a very powerful and sometimes tyrannical voice for people that actually squashes a sense of agency or initiative or capacity because when we listen to that voice, that voice is mostly oriented towards what's wrong with us, how can we improve, where are we not enough, where are we deficient, what we've done wrong. And so, of course, any pattern or any tendency we develop internally, it also manifests externally. So that same judging mind that's often very unforgiving and cruel to ourselves, we, of course, project that outward and we we become similarly critical and impatient and unforgiving of others. And, of course, we, that voice makes others more of the other. And as you say, sometimes we use the judging mind as a way to prop ourselves up or to put people down or to confirm our perspective or to validate our righteous indignation. And, you know, from my experience of working with people for a couple of decades now is that voice rarely leads to harmony, rarely leads to constructive engagement. And I make this important distinction between our faculties of wise discrimination, of clear discernment versus this negatively toned judgmental mind that is purely oriented towards the negative and what's wrong with ourselves, with others, in a way that actually makes us feel shame or makes us feel bad about ourselves, not so it inspires action, but more so we collapse into a sense of despair or hopelessness or depression. And so the reason I wrote this book is because, you know, like you, I want to catalyze people to both understand who they are, to cultivate the heart of loving awareness for themselves and the world, and also to optimize who they are so they can be full, engaged, active human beings. And when we're assaulted by these thoughts day in, day out, that we're not good enough, that we're stupid, or we're, you know, all the things that we've done wrong, that just leads to a sense of paralysis. And so if we start to pay attention to this voice and work with it skillfully, we actually free up energy. We see ourselves more in a more balanced way. We, We can see both our strengths and our challenges, and we can actually also start to view others and the world with a more constructive, positive, 
optimistic bias rather than the negative bias. And so we become actually, we free up our energy for change and transformation. And of course, as we know, this time, these next few years, the, we're going to be asked to really step up in our power and strength and unity. And the more we can free up the internal shackles through mindfulness, through compassion, through discernment of what's skillful with these, uh, with our thoughts and what's unhelpful, then we're actually going to be of greater service. I love that. And I could see that for many of us that are struggling with that, like I mentioned earlier, Mark, it's like I am checking myself in terms of my own amplification. What I've been sharing a lot lately is just my virtues. And I know that virtues don't rank high as, you know, attacking or or speaking really tenaciously about something, but I look at virtues as a vibration and intention, which still doesn't release me of my role of being black or Indian or Republican or Democrat or, or British or American. You know, I see virtues being a beautiful representation of those parts that I happen to be playing. And I, I know that as we go perhaps further on in this history that's unfolding, whether it's in Britain or America or other parts of the world, I feel that there is a call for that inner empowerment. And if we don't become powerful, then I think the negative inner critic is what's going to take over. And we're going to see a world that we're accustomed to seeing on television of just, you know, what do you call it? Remember that old movie by... Is it Mel Gibson, The Warrior? Remember that? The Road Warrior or something? Where the world had come to an end and everyone was just struggling just to get some water just to survive. And it's just always this negative energy that tends to be so palpable in the narrative. And I think what we're trying to do as, as folks in our journey is how to make this conversation of being more at peace with yourself, more filled with virtues, the norm, the norm rather than the one that wants to give up hope, you know, wants to go against the norm of being virtuous. You know, one of your chapter titles in your book, it says, Giving Up Hope of a Better Past. And I'd love if you could speak to that, because it's a very deep title, and I would love to be able to understand the genesis behind that, Giving Up Hope of a Better Past. Could you speak to that Yes, of course. And I think it's very apropos of where we are now because there's a, there's a, there's a vast swathe of the population in coulda, woulda, shoulda mind, you know, in self-recrimination based on the election result. What didn't I see? What didn't I understand? How did I not see this coming? What could I have done differently? What actions, what donations, what this or that I could have done to influence this outcome? And, you know, we can't, change the past and the critic is very uh, skilled at having one 2020 hindsight it's very easy to look back and go oh now I see what happened now I see what I could have done now I see how I could have had influence but of course at the, at the time we I, I trust in in the, the goodness of our nature that we do the best we can whatever resources we have and we can't know everything including for example election outcomes and so one of the sort of cruel ways that the critic manifests is it will troll over our past our decisions around relationships or the things that we've said or done that maybe weren't so skillful or kind or the ways that we contracted in fear or in hostility in certain conditions. And we will, that part of the mind is very unforgiving. It will relentlessly Uh, admonish ourselves in a way that we just we've already had the experience which was painful and then our critic reminds us over and over again that we did it wrong that we should have done better and it comes in this voice of often the the critic comes in this voice of a coach like oh you should do better you shouldn't do that again you shouldn't do that again that was terrible and there's sort of an, an, an implication that oh if I just berate myself enough then I'll surely not repeat that action but if the problem is that berating and that, that assaulting us um, actually just makes us feel bad. It makes us feel hopeless. It makes us feel wrong. It makes us feel shame, which is not great inspiration for corrective action in the future. It just engenders a sense of worthlessness. So, you know, I've been talking to my father who's, you know, in his late 70s, and, and he has a lot of regrets about 
certain things, the way he uh, led his life, his parenting, his, you know, and I, and he was actually very keen to read my book, which uh, was very sweet. Um, and because he wanted to find a way to free himself from that endless uh, tyranny from the mind and that, that phrase, give up all hope of a better past, means, you know, life is so much asking that we radically surrender and we radically surrender, including to the past. It is what it is. It, it was what it was. And we can learn from it. We can study it. We can, we can reflect. But the, 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 the beating ourselves up and the lashing ourselves out actually just causes a contraction and doesn't lead to inquiry. And, of course, inquiry and investigation is how we understand and how we actually learn so we can make better decisions, better choices, better actions in the future. So the more that we can free ourselves up from giving ourselves a hard time about what we did or didn't do, then actually we can, we can look at it and, and then have a healthy remorse and a healthy intention rather than guilt and collapse. Mm. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there, but being on our own spiritual journey, you tend to sort of have a particular formula that you use when maybe you end up in a storm, an emotional storm, a mental storm, a spiritual storm, a storm between spirit and matter, a storm between finance, a storm between a relationship, a storm between the fact that you just can't change your external environment. And I've had those times where I'm just like, get over it, move on, Om Shanti, let's go. And I just keep going. But have you ever been in those uh, instances where you were like, no, what is this? I've got to sit with this. I don't want to move this on forward and not recognize or learn what it is that my spirit needs to understand here. So either it doesn't repeat this scene or it deals with the scene at a much higher level of consciousness than how I've met it at this time. Have you ever been in that place? If so, what have you done? Yeah, well, you know, what comes to mind is not so much an action that I did, but um, some years ago I was, some deep layers of of anxiety came up, some some waves that were very paralyzing and gripping, and it lasted for months. It was a very painful period in my life. And, um, you know, of course, the first reaction when we have anything like that is, oh, I don't want to have this. I'd rather it go away. How can I avoid it? How can I change it? How can I meditate it away? And sometimes, you know, many things in life where we can't simply flick a switch. We can't go into meditation and disappears. It, it, it demands that we open to it. It demands that we soften and yield. It demands that we listen and hold with a loving presence and to see what what is this? What are these deep fears that, that from in, in my case were from very early childhood and some traumatic experiences and it requires that we we actually just have that loving patience to to the melt into it and uh, and the phrase that would come to me was was if this is with me till i die it's okay and and to find that place of absolute surrender into this is how it is i don't like it i don't want it i wish it go away and you know the loving heart, spacious awareness has capacity to hold it. And in that holding and in the relaxing, it actually opens up the door for inquiry and understanding. And, mm-hmm. and at, o- over time, when I, when I could fully bring that loving presence to it, and it didn't matter whether it was there or not because I was more resting in that loving presence, then actually things, the understanding began to unfold. So I think that's really, and I talk about this fusion in the book of mindfulness and compassion, this awareness and love. I think they're essential, whether it's dealing with the fallout from election, from the pain and grief and sorrow that we carry, from dealing with uh, a political opponent who's challenging our views and ideology. How do we bring that loving presence that has understanding you know, within it? I think that's also, you know, a lot of the emotional stuff that we're picking up is the intense nastiness of this campaign and what could communicate to our next generation emerging is that it's okay to be like that. You will win. You will get to the top. 
if you behave like uh-huh. that. And uh-huh. and parents are having a really hard time to try to communicate what that means and, and, and how to handle that. So what would you tell children today if they were confused or even parents who are struggling with sharing with their kids, well, let me explain what this was all about. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I was just at dinner with some friends yesterday mm-hmm. who both have young sons, uh, nine and thirteen, and they were similarly struggling. How do I, in the next morning, how do I tell my sons that this person who has displayed a lot of very painful, aggressive, abusive uh, language and, and actions? How do I say that this is this man is now president elect? And, uh, you know, it was interesting hearing how they framed it. I'm not a parent, so I'm very cautious about <laughs> suggesting how parents <laughs> should should be with their children. But I, but I was taking, you know, I listened carefully to what parents uh, tell me. And one of the fathers was talking about how he got a list out of all the presidents of the last several hundred years and talked about, you know, this person I would vote for. This person I wouldn't vote for. This person had two terms I wouldn't have voted for. This person I would. And you know, talked about the electoral process and framed it in a way of, you know, that fortunately there's checks and balances. And so sometimes people do get in who are, are riding on a campaign of fear, you know, appealing to people's fear and scarcity and using blame of others, of scapegoating others, as, as a way to gain support. And that's not a value that we support, because you know, we clearly see the painfulness of that. So it was, it was really holding the paradox of, yes, this happened, and we also know that the people on the other end of that treatment are feeling a lot of pain and fear and terror and lack of safety, and is that the world we want to create? And so he was pointing to, and I think I would point to, there are many terrible role models out there who have a lot of power, fame, success, um, historically and present time. And we also know that causes tremendous pain. Look at Nazi Germany. Look at Stalin. Look at these other figures where untold suffering was unleashed. And then we have people like Dr. King and Gandhi who... Uh, wonderful exemplaries of how to act in a political sphere with kindness and with with strength. And, you know, and to ask that question, what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of world would you like to create? What kind of world makes you feel safe and connected? And not to disregard the two most valuable representations that we have lived through historically that have stood for truth, Dr. Martin Luther King and Gandhi, and yet they were both mm-hmm. assassinated. And, and again, mm-hmm. it's always been such a hard journey, not, I wouldn't say a hard journey, but a journey that consistently calls us to stand in our faith of values and purity and truth and beauty, because it's like it's like we're in a time, you know, it, we're in an age where no matter what we do, good, there's another force that seems to do it better, that seems to be more organized, like even peace movements. I mean, peace mm-hmm. movements, I wonder if they were to become organized, if we would actually end all the wars in the world, and yet war is so organized. I came across... Mm-hmm. Um, um, a slide that I did for an initiative I, I, I started in May called Meditate the Vote. And in this slide, I want you to see, it's we call a woman, um, let, let me get it straight for you because I think it's so important. If a man has a house stacked to the ceiling with newspapers, we call him crazy. If a woman has a trailer house full of cats, we call her nuts. When people pathologically hoard so much cash that they impoverish others, put them on the cover of Fortune magazine, and pretend hmm. they're role models. How do you speak to that? <laughs> well, that's very potent. And, um, <laughs> you know, actually what comes up for me is tremendous sadness. 
it, it, I feel, mm. I actually feel teary just hearing that, just how sad and misguided we are that, you know, I think, yeah. I think this country, um, you know, leads that uh, putting up on, on huge pedestals, the, as you say, the, 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 the massive hoarders of wealth and greed and, it's it's sad in that that's what the the that's what we export to the world to aspire to, and we know from all the research that that, that once one's material basic needs have been met, any more wealth after that does not increase happiness one iota. You know the the rates of you know depression and suicide and all all the other dysfunctions that happen in the upper echelons of society are proof that that wealth, that that hoarding does not generate well-being. And then when we research people who live lives of generosity, particularly of kindness, they, they experience a sense of well-being and ease and fullness and fulfillment and meaning in their lives. And it's just sad that the society is built around the supporting of that ideology that wealth and materialism is the doorway to happiness when clearly it actually robs people of a sense of contentment and well-being. So, and I think it's up for, you know, especially us in the spiritual dimension to, to stay strong, putting forward a different point of view that what's most important is to actually share our abundance and wealth and actually to see the blessings that we have and to create a more equal society. I felt the same way. It took me a few days for me to spiritually allow myself to let the tears fall, not because of who won the election, but because of the state of the humanity. And, and, and why is it that as spiritual individuals on our path, we've not been able to orchestrate a narrative as effective as the narrative of doom and gloom and greed and power and decisiveness and exclusion and the elite and, you know, the Christians are stronger than the Muslims, or the Muslims are getting too strong, so let's put them down. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. If you were to create a narrative, you were to create something that would help with making this language that we're speaking and this way of living something that needs to be put on the table for policies, for conversations in conferences. One of the things that we've been doing is actually allowing there to be an openness, that there's an open meditation, an open moment of reflection for major conferences that are not spiritually dent, bent, but they're, they're focused on the secular, but that we must start off from a place inside of ourselves. And, and it's not been easy, but it does happen on, on rare occasions. What would be your idea as to how best we can implement something, if you have one, that we can start to move more towards creating a narrative that could be that impactful? Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting. The irony is one of the narratives that, that I, I was actually very supportive of was the narrative Stronger Together which I thought was actually a beautiful counterpoint to the demonizing um, of others and the fear mongering of other, whether it's Syrians or Mexicans or whoever the latest um, scapegoat group was. And I did actually appreciate that message that we are stronger together, that we need each other, that we need support, community, collaboration, and that that's only the only way that humanity will survive as climate crisis increases, as resources decrease, as access to fresh water and energy decrease. I think the only way forward is to find a collaborative unity where we start to dissolve the sense of rigid boundary of self, of nation state, of um, hoarding resources and intellectual knowledge and and whatnot so i don't have i wish i had the narrative <laughs> that i think it's that an I interesting think would conversation work. it's great no uh, but i do think something about you know given the the polarization the the, the tribal like, tribalization that's happening in europe and the states and and elsewhere um, i do feel like we have to have a, a narrative of you know commonality and unity and strength 
in connection rather than strength by oppressing others and drawing up the walls. So I would like us to see us, you know, just like Trudeau from Canada basically was opening his border to Mexican immigrants uh, yesterday, he made an announcement. It was a very beautiful, very uh, inclusive, welcoming uh, counterpoint to the fear and the, and, and the pulling up the drawbridge that's happening here in this current climate. And so I think the more that we can emphasize we are in this together and the climate crisis is the best example of how we're in this together. And if we, if one of us resists, we all go down together. And so how do we, mm. so the narrative of, you know, stronger together, unity, Beautiful. you know, yeah. strength and unity feels very important. And I think that message should be continued. I swear to you, if I didn't deeply feel that I know that we're all souls and I know that we're all on our own journey and that we've come into the school of life at different times, you know. So we're going to interpret things differently. But I have to say this before we come to closing of this beautiful dialogue that we've both shared together. Why is it that those few don't get it? And I'm not just talking about America. I'm talking about, you know, tribal villages in Africa that are still warring today. I'm talking about, mm-hmm. you know, political rivals in South Africa. I'm talking about everyone. I'm talking about a marriage where two people might have spent 20 years together and raised three or four or five children together, and they reach a point that they can't feel stronger together works for them. Can you speak Mm -hmm. to that? Why is it that we don't get it to it? And do you have a a thought towards that. <laughs> I know I'm giving you some well, homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it's a great question and great and very, very uh, good reflection. I think, for, you know, I've, I've been studying a fair amount of neuroscience over the last five years. And I, I do feel like that one of the challenges that we're facing is the limitation of the hard wiring of brains and our survival circuitry. You know, we, our brains are basically haven't adapted for the last few thousand years. And so if, if we're living in a brain that's basically built for survival, for hunter and gathering, then, then that primitive circuitry is oriented around my survival, protection, defense, fear, threat. And what's so interesting is I feel like our biology, the limitation of our biology is hitting up against in, you know, a global crisis, particularly the climate crisis, where we, the species has never been asked to think beyond its immediate net of concerns, food, warmth, shelter, mate, etc. And here we are being asked to step out of the prison of our individualized uh, consciousness and needs and to see that our survival now not just depends on our obtaining water and food and safety, but actually depends on the survival of the planet and the health of ecosystems and the survival of all kinds of species. And so I feel like it's this leap in consciousness that I was feeling hopeful prior to this election, and especially after Paris, that there was some slow-growing nudge towards that collective understanding that we have to, we are in this together and we do have to have a long range vision. We have to think seven generations or 70 generations ahead. And I still believe that the majority of people, ordinary working people get that, but the bastions of power and whether it's governmental or corporate that goes against their needs are trying very hard to say, no, that's not the way we need to draw up and protect what we have and keep others out. And so I think we're, we're in this sort of very cla- you know, important cosmic clash of those two values. And I do ultimately trust that that greater understanding or widening of consciousness will prevail, but it's certainly being very challenged and assaulted by what I think is the death grip of that more limited, egoic, fearful consciousness. I don't know if you're feeling it, but you might be going through waves where there's this anxiousness, this this Mm. internal feeling of my own division that I'm, I'm witnessing within my own consciousness and seeing what it looks like in the exterior world. 
and, and wanting so much to find my own inner narratives based on my relationship with God to unite that conversation and and to know that that will be the tool and i keep going right back to the unity of our country the unity of nations the unity of our world the unity of the global environment the cure is in the quality and the intentionality of what we're thinking do you find that you're still going through waves even though we are weeks after the election you know here we are like almost two weeks into the election Yes, I, I'm really glad you mentioned that because so this weekend I I woke up in the night gripped in terror, and the terror and the anxiety lasted, and it's I can still feel the residue now, but it lasted for several days, and I kept inquiring where is this terror? What am I worried about? There's nothing objectively threatening me. I feel safe. There's a lot of blessings in my life, and and I I you know I perhaps I'm picking up on the on the collective I think that's partly what it is the, there's a huge amount of uncertainty and fear particularly you know if you're muslim person of color etc and I do feel those waves come through that that I think that's happening collectively and again I think you know I'm drawing my practice to be able to hold that with as much kindness and clarity and compassion and also stay curious what is this fear? And it really, I, I really saw how it influenced my mind. I suddenly started feeling scarce and worried about money and finances and security. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Two days ago, I was just having a conversation about how blessed and abundant and, and how much good fortune <laughs> I have in my life. And then suddenly I'm worried about, you know, the rent check. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Where is, who, who is this? And yeah. I think there's a, a lot of fear in the country. And again, that's, I think, why we have to come together to support each other. I've been so inspired by the demonstrations and the peace walks and the marches that saying there's a huge body of the population that's really wanting to become more active and state a different point of view than, what's, than what prevailed in the election. Mm, I love that. Well, it's good that I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know if that's any consolation. But I, it and, makes and you feel a little why, better, too. Right. And the reason why it's, and maybe as illuminaries on the planet, maybe we even, you know, are walking alongside the, the company of a little bit of ego that maybe we had expected ourselves to be at another dimension of our of our journey that we could be what we have spoken completely the embodied state of that versus what we're witnessing is that also we are being called like I shared on a on a panel that we held a wonderful event called Healing and Reconciliation last week and I mm. think that we're even being called to also clean our act up and go are you really what you're saying and so mm-hmm. everyone is being affected everybody and, and it's just such a profound time to be uh, awake. It's a profound time to be awake, I have to tell you. Mark, thank you for a beautiful conversation and a beautiful time together. And hopefully what we've shared with all of our friends on the air, um, that you will take a nugget from this and it will help you to move forward as well and to amplify your goodness and your virtues. And um, as we get to a close, Mark, um, leave us with a closing good vision for yourself and for the world and also a website for our listeners to get a hold of your copy of your new book, perhaps Make Peace With Your Mind, How Mindfulness and Compassion Can Free You From Your Inner Critic. Sure. Well, what intention and aspiration I have for myself and for others is that, you know, there are times in life where we're asked to wake up. We're asked to not go to sleep. We're asked to understand what our values are, to allow those uh, convictions to move us. And at this time, we're being asked to step up and to join together and be more visible, be more vocal, to stay grounded in our sense of compassion and kindness, but also to move with a fierce love in the world. And in terms of my work, people can reach me through markcoleman.org, markcoleman.org, and that leads you to many websites of my work in the world in nature and organizations and whatnot. 
And I also want to say what well, it's been a delightful conversation. I really appreciate the depth of your wisdom and heart and what a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. To be continued and all the very best. Yes, likewise. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. So as you've heard, my friends, we are also uh, within ourselves checking where we are in the game and what we need to do and be. And we're not immune to the effects. I know some of us, you know, I've heard my friends say, oh, I was fine. And even though I told everyone, please do not take this election lightly, Mr. Trump could definitely win this election. And what is that going to mean? And and I remembered that. I remembered saying that over and over again to so many folks, that um Despite where you are, Muslim, Jew, white, black, rich, poor, this is a collective opportunity. This is a collective narrative. This is, I almost feel like God has come and is kind of showing us something. You know, he's looking at all of us uh, sort of in the courtroom and he's like, okay, now kids, how have you been? What have you been up to? I just am realizing that it just feels like we're having our day of our personal internal, I don't want to use the word judgment, but I want to use the word we are um, internally checking ourselves now more than ever before. Thank you so much for joining us on America Meditating Radio. You know how much we value your time and energy, and you could be tuning into any show whatsoever, but she chose ours, and so we thank you for that. To make the ending of our show a little bit light, I know we've been talking about some deep subjects, and who likes to be deep for 30 minutes or 45 minutes? Let's just go up and take it a step notch. Don't forget to join us on America Meditating Radio 24-7 syndicated radio, but also feel free to follow some of the naughtiness that I'm up to on my Twitter handle, America Meditating, and only if you're a friend. You know, I have so many friends around the world, and, you know, they always call and tell me, why isn't your Twitter handle, like, much more? You know so many people. I go, yeah, but 90% of those people on my Twitter handle, I can call them. (laughs) So even though I do tell you to just sign up, do know that I'm really invested in my face-to-face experience with you. And so feel free to come by the Meditation Museum if you happen to be in town or local. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission. And we are here to love each other the same. Let's get moving, America. Take care. Here's Happy by Pharrell Williams.
Jackie Lennon.